for those of you not familiar with Scotland, first thing is, what is Scotland? And why is what is rural about it? Well, 98% of Scotland is rural. So outside Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, pretty much everything is, is rural. And with that comes the same consequences as all other rural locations, probably in the UK, an age difference in the demographics of the population. The older you are, the more likely you are to be in rural. The younger folk go off to the city. Um, probably the same everywhere. One of the ones that always interests me, and as yet we fail to see the policy reflecting this, but in rural uh, Scotland, and it's probably the same for yourselves, the quality of housing in terms of energy efficiency is drastically different between rural and the rest of Scotland, um, dominated by the poorer housing. Uh, I sit in a house that's allegedly band C and it's cold enough when the wind blows, never mind the rest. So Scotland is dominantly rural. Quick comparison with Shropshire. Um, well, there we go. Some things are strikingly similar. 98% is classified as rural. Um, some things aren't. The sheer scale is obviously different and the population and the rural population density in Scotland is a good deal less than it is in Shropshire. Um, maybe as a direct consequence of there not being people there, we have a lot more that's classed as a 4G not spot than Shropshire does. But surprisingly, where there are buildings, broadband will get to them pretty much the same. So, yeah, two places not dissimilar. Density city, isn't it? Which for a, quite a while we thought, oh, yeah, that makes sense. All you're dealing with the density. But the more we got into it, the less true that actually turned out to be. And this is a slide borrowed from a group called 5G Rural First, which you may all be aware of. They were one of the first 5G pilot studies. And they were looking at 5G applications. But their observations tied in exactly with ours and are true. So on the left hand side, you've got the dilemma of the service provider. So your mobile or broadband in cities. It costs them quite a bit to deploy their architecture because it is a city and you're disturbing people. But the return on investment is high because there's lots of people. In urban, not so expensive to deploy, but then again, not so much money. But then when you go into that red sector in the triangle, and in Scotland and Shropshire, that's 98% of the landmass, it is phenomenally expensive to deploy your technology and the returns if you just try and deploy the model from the city are very small. However, 5G Rural First and ourselves, when we sat down and talked about this, we flipped it and came up with a new perspective. In cities, yes, there are lots of people, but there tend to be relatively few use cases. Um, super fast broadband, so you can have Un, untapped 4K streaming movies to your phone or the IoT end of things, uh, smart parking, smart bins, smart street lights. There are relatively few use cases. Whereas when you go rural, there may be less people, but there are far more use cases. It's, in fact, it's exponential, the number of use cases. And that means there's lots of opportunity but the urban business model just won't work. And that is true no matter how much money the government throws at it, it is just not going to work. So could the only way really to start making it work is to change the way you think about things. And rather than each company going out and trying to win customers, you start to collaborate. So 
that's why we started to think about a co-op model of some sort. The outside in has to do it differently. It's not sequential subsidies from the center. It needs to be holistic, collaborative, and to produce a sustainable long-term business. Can't just be flash in the pan. The sort of people that invest in co-ops are not venture capitalists. Venture capitalists want to flip the company in three years. Co-op investors are there for the long-term and mutual sustainable business. Now in Scotland, there's, oh, somebody's come off mute. In Scotland, there's a strong and vibrant co-op community. You can look up saos.coop. It's the mother co-op for all the farming co-ops. And they're very, very switched on about data. So as we researched co-ops, we reached out to these guys and they instantly understood what we were looking at doing and saw great value for farming. Now that's an important thing. There was value there to be given to farming because as we spoke to them, what we realized was that if we became part of the agricultural farming family, that gave us something that was invaluable to us. And that was unrivaled site access because it was, it was sort of the scale of this program is we would need to acquire two to two and a half thousand sites across rural Scotland. You've got to industrialize it. You've got to be part of the family. You can't be individually negotiating. So, so that was our fam. That was our pathway into understanding that a co-op was a vehicle. So, just let's be clear on what a co-op is. So, it's a co-op. It's not the co-op. Nothing wrong with the co-op. It is just there are thousands of more co-ops than the co-op. But underneath them all, they have the seven cooperative principles. And the important ones here for creating a business is it's, it's open membership. All members take economic participation, so they invest. But is democratic is what, at the extreme, it is one vote per member. So somebody may invest one for one share and somebody may invest for a thousand shares they have an equal say at the table and that's very important because rural there is a huge demographic not just in in the farming community about the size and the clout but within the total community that we're trying to serve here because this isn't just for farming farming is the tactical vehicle and ultimately that invested in democratic process is intending to bring education and cooperation amongst co-ops and everybody else in the community. So key thing, do not confuse a co-op with a not-for-profit. We have some extremely profitable co-ops in the farming community in Scotland. Also, they tend to be born out of adversity. So the where there is either an opportunity or a threat there is a strong realization and culture amongst the farming community here that banding together is more likely to deliver the opportunity or defeat the threat. And they see collective value as the driver. That's an important thing here that value is what we're talking about. It's not just monetary exchange. So the little thing here we call the, the dance. In rural, connectivity it's a bit like have a room everybody comes in and they've all got something of value to trade uh, they all have an appreciation that somebody else in that room has got something that they want but they've realized there are no more one-to-one -one trades left and this is why we call it the dance it's a bit like a Scottish dance you turn to the left face the person on your left and scratch their back and ultimately, that scratch goes around the circle, it comes back, and you get the benefit. This is the critical thing about rural. It is such a mixture of stakeholders, and there is no one killer app out there. 
to deliver value, you have to think about how you do this. And a good example would be if an insurance company invests in this network, there's no real direct business that they can do. But the fact that they have invested means that water utilities, environmental agencies can perform projects which lead to natural flood management, which massively reduces the flooding hazard on an insurance company's books. So you have to think about it as collaborative joint venture exchanges here. So we're a co-op. It means we can work with value. So Smart Rural, what it is, it's an entity that's going to deploy and operate the LP1 network. It will serve as a matchmaker and a change agent in Scottish agriculture, because tactically, by changing people's attitude to digital in farming, we can get the sites we need. What it's not, we're not running this as a closed shop. Farming is a tactical operational way of getting 2000 sites up and running. Once the network is there, anybody can come to us and say, right, I'd like to use the system. It's not a closed shop. We're not an app developer or a device builder. Where, as I say, the, this technology has been up and running in other countries five, six, seven years. There's a lot of stuff out there already. We want to transfer it. We don't want to develop it ourselves. What ultimately will happen as the, the co-op starts to generate funds uh, and there's a surplus against maintenance costs, then we can start looking at filling technology gaps where we see there's a, a use case but no solution. We can start funding those sort of things on behalf of our members. But this is, that is not our principle. We will only go there if nobody in the market is filling that gap. And we're not in ourselves the data analyst. There are far smarter people out there, and hopefully some of them are on the call, where the data flow that we are enabling will start to be fruit and useful for these people to do the analytics and give value back to the farming and rural communities by getting into that data lake and coming out with some gems. So the, the value driver in all of this for agriculture and this, we have to have something, otherwise why would people change? Why would people let them, let us put stuff on their um, properties? You'll have heard the phrase precision agriculture and you'll probably perceive it in, in terms of self-steering tractors, accurately plowing fields and sowing seeds and big combine harvesters gathering data as they go. And that, that is true, it's well used, but it tends to be arable, it tends to be big farms and big machinery. That must leave a lot of opportunities behind. And this is where we've been looking into. And we're not alone. There's been really significant studies done in the US and Australia recently that have looked at this. And these are two very big practitioners of traditional precision agriculture. So digital potential, yeah, huge. In Australia, they estimated that there was another 25% GVA to move from what they said was precision to decision agriculture. And these, as you can see from the graphic on the right, the lion's share of that is actually an automation and labor saving. Now, automation isn't a, an array of robots. It's about gathering data, say, from an inanimate object. Is my water trough running dry? And saving yourself labor and time because you don't have to go and check it. You put a simple device in it that tells you when it needs attention. That instrumentation and autom automation is phenomenally important. This isn't about getting rid of labor. It's reflecting the fact that we've got an ever decreasing pool of labor to work. And so this is where decision agriculture is what we're trying to do. And where we're focusing as smart rural is, that, yeah, without the connectivity, nothing happens. But you've also got to start 
working with the farmers to understand what is appropriate data and bring it forward so that you've got decision support tools in place. And that, that doesn't matter whether it's at the simple LP1 end or 5G, that is the same truth. You've got to understand what is the data that you want. And the other thing about data is, and we're teeing this up for agriculture, is you can harvest data. If you get the appropriate data for the industry, get the network in place, that you can start working with the co-ops to help them understand that they can own it and they can monetize that data collectively because there are a lot of people out there who want to analyze that data to sell further value into that market. So you are now going to be seeing bushels of data. So we've made the case for change. We've chosen an agri co-op as the vehicle and the identified value that we exchange into that community. How do we, what's the nuts and bolts? Well, the nuts and bolts can be extremely simple, little graphic picture on the left is a barn mounted LoRaWAN computer aerial and backhaul. That's all it is. Just need a 240 volt pin, three pin plug. The one on the right is a bit more um, involved. This is proving as the hashtag said, nowhere's too rural solar and wind powered, this rig sort of hints of what else is possible because this setup isn't just for LoRaWAN, it can run 4G and even 5G off that rural location. And this is where there is another opportunity for smart rural, and this is why it's truly an outside in process. The equipment that we put on a shed, like the picture in the middle, is made purposely to rent out space. And that can be simple 4G infill, or even with the local authority that we're now talking to, 10 gig wireless broadband, daisy chaining between our sheds and barns to give them the ability, a fiber free ability to get to their assets. So it's, it opens the doors to a whole number of other things, but it's all pivoted on the value that farmers get. So just a very quick sort of few slide, couple of slides here. This is a change management program. And the way we're doing our bit is to engage with the farming community. And we've set up three digital demonstrator farms in the Northeast, different um, arable, upland grazing, intensive arable, all the different aspects of farming in Scotland. And what we're doing with them, some very simple use cases. The critical thing on all of those, whether it's a vehicle tracker or monitoring the weather, it's simple data flow, but showing the farmer that having that data to hand on his phone or his desktop means he can make decisions quicker and more effectively and efficient. This is how we un this is how we're getting the farmers on board, deploy the technology and it spreads. So these are the various building blocks. Now is outside in this true rural digital connectivity, is there a feasible scenario? Well we believe there is, but you You've got to start from a blank sheet of paper. All the incremental stuff just doesn't work. And you don't run away from the barriers. You've got to meet them head on and be creative. It does need collaboration. Now, some of those will be new players. Some of them will be old. Uh, I'm not, not referring to the farmers there as old, but uh, you've got to have people with an established position and objectively look for the strengths. Um, you're going to have to rock the boat because it doesn't suit everybody uh, that we're going and putting an outside in. The fiber selling community will not appreciate that there is an alternative, etc. And not everybody can be on the team. Um, and this quote is one that I like just to remind people is, and this comes from senior people in DCMS, that 5G isn't 
anything other than a solution that allows you to do what you want, where you want, and at a cost you want. And therefore, they view 5G, 5G as an integration of everything from 0G to the bleeding edge of 5G. So it includes LP1 where it is appropriate. So having been through the journey, what are some lessons? You've got to work on parallel fronts, figure out how to get the infrastructure out there as cheaply and as effectively as possible and industrialize site access. It's, it's a change management program. Figure out what your use cases are that are going to engage the people, recruit your champions and get them to shout about it and engage with your ecosystem, demystify, translate, make them smarter. It's not just the technology, it's the people. And you've got to approach it like a startup. Um, all those things, pivot when you need to, be prepared to change, and like today, hopefully go out and make some new friends. So my last slide, hopefully you'll have a few takeaways. Rural is not a low density city. There is a collaborative dance to be had if you're going to achieve anything rurally. Being a co-op doesn't mean that you're a co the co-op. Get identify value and win some converts, and that's how it happens. And any questions? Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, just for people that have um, joined us uh, throughout this meeting. Um, there is a chat uh, button which is on the centre of the screen. You'll see a little box with some lines in. If you click on that, you'll see a conversation toolbar come up on the right hand side of your screen. And there are questions in there. So for any of those people who've joined us throughout, if you'd like to submit a question, please do. Um, and I'll just make a start with Paul. Thank you very much, Paul. It's a really interesting presentation. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, if I just start with some of the questions that have come in. <laughs> um, are you laughing at me? <laughs> no, no, I've, no I've, j I've just started reading them and I'm thinking, oh, yep, OK, I can answer the canal one. Yeah, do you want to start on that one then? So that's from Steve Bristow. So Steve's here. He's, uh, his face is on the screen at the moment. Uh, Steve, um, two weeks ago, I'd have said no. Um, but I've had some really good conversations with Scottish canals. Now, Scottish canals aren't as widespread, obviously, as the ones in uh, England, but they have three significant networks for leisure, and they have, I think, 19 feeding uh, reservoirs, all of which are very remote, none of which have any instrumentation. So, yes, we're starting to work with them um, to look at how we could involve them in our projects. Thanks, Paul. Can, can I come back on that one? Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and just link it with the other question that uh, hopefully you'll come to in a moment. I mean, it seems to me that canals are a very interesting test case because by their very nature, they interweave uh, the agricultural community to such an extent, and they're themselves very remote places and there's a long-term question about canal users leisure users expectations of being able to uh, to use the technologies that they use every day whether it be mobile phones or internet-based work or whatever um, and then from the the uh, the boat uh, hirers or operators point of view uh, there's the there's the question of being able to identify where the boat is you know and in case of emergencies or problems Doing it now. Scotland has a, an advantage. It has a very active agri co-op um, community. England less so. England is they're very big. Um, all the dairies is a co-op. It is massive. Where Scotland tends to have a collection of smaller ones. I think we have seventy active agricultural co-ops but it all that is is it's an established way of doing business up here it is in england but it's sort of been purged a bit because of the size of the companies that are now using it but i think if you get a group of p 
people and you can show them a value proposition, they will collaborate. The cooperative is just a very convenient vehicle. You may have to create that ethos as part of your project in Shropshire, but it's the way to do it. So if you had the chance, would you do it all over again? Oh, yeah. <laughs> And I mean, ultimately, and this is a, a sort of business conversation, as as I was saying to you earlier, sort of we, we will be uh, coming to appearing in a county near you at some point in the near future once COVID lifts. But yeah, this this is the sort of thing that even at the moment, because this is a digital and sort of sort of virtual network, it doesn't matter where. Somebody says, right, I want to have a five base station network, Langothlin Canal, to set something up. Can you establish and maintain the network for us? Um, yes, we can. So Smart Rural doesn't have to limit itself to Scotland. And in fact, because of some of the use cases of tracking of animals, we'll be into Cumbria and Northumberland anyway because animals go across the border for finishing or to the abattoir, et cetera. And that is one of the use cases is to track those animals. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I can't see any more um, questions there for you. So I'm just going to um, end with your presentation by saying thank you so much and to let everybody know that those, uh, your slides and, and this presentation will be available on um, our YouTube channel. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just going to bring up um, a slide about next week's presentation. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so next week we've got um, Dr. Fiona Williams from the university. Um, and she's going to talk about business productivity in rural areas. So everybody is very welcome to join us for that next week that will be a re pre recorded presentation um so she won't actually be available on that call um unfortunately because she's teaching but um she is um recorded a presentation for me to share um if you've got any other questions please drop them through on email to crest or tweets or come and see us on our website and stay in touch and i look forward to seeing you all next week thanks thanks again paul thank you very much pleasure thanks to everyone Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.